know those rules, they don't participate in those markets, they'll do a trade for you, but they'll charge you almost how much. It's like anything else. You bring your fancy foreign car into the guy in the local corner who goes, oh, wow, I fix up Chevy usually, but I'll try it, I'll see what I can do. So, but for the test, they assume you're dealing with option brokers, one commission only, a package deal. Now, in numbers, what can they ask us here? The two break-evens. What do we do first? Call up 85 plus 792. And we also put down 85 minus 7, 70. Now, in this case, as the seller, anywhere in the middle is a gain. We want a stable market, the market to stay in that range, the pretty big range we got there. The moment stays in the range, we make money. So any prices between 92 and 78, you win. Equal, you're even, and outside the range, you lose. Theoretically, how far outside the range could you be? Unlimited. So we know our max gain is the $700 premium we received. If both options expire, we keep the seven. But if it goes in the money, max loss unlimited. So like I said, a straddle's a lot like a single option. You do both break even, but there's nothing new for the break even. Max gain loss is the same as a call option. They say the market went up to 90, the call's the money. Down to 70, the puts in the money. So single options and straddles are important for the basics to understand them, but you don't get a ton of the questions because there's only three or four things you can ask on a single option and three or four things on a straddle. You get max gain loss, gain loss of the price, break even, and boy, there, stable model, what market condition you want. Let's see. All right, we want to take a break for about 10 minutes, and we'll come back and do spreads and hedging, which is the two main strategies. But to do those, you need to know the basics. But those are definitely more questions. So I thought back about 10 minutes for spreads. So essentially, what's for your reading? And as you turn about three or four pages into the document, you're going to see another document, and it says at the top, option study sheet. Probably one of the most resourceful documents that I've seen over the last years that is a study worksheet that really explains all the key formulas along with all the key tra uh, trading uh, strategies uh, that uh, you're mastering from your education. And this first page, if you'll just look at me, in, in, in Matrix, is really explaining the remaining body of work that is a very, very informative uh, document called the Option Study Worksheet that I'm going to ask you to work with specifically tonight, tomorrow night. Uh, Built into the back is another document that has five pages to it. It says at the top, trading strategies. Again, the buyer call, the buyer put, spread or straddle, the key formulas. It says trading strategies on it. You'll get to it past it. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's another way of taking a look at some of these fundamental regulations. And that's five pages, 20 through 25. And then right after that, the last document in the back, entitled Options, it says eight cases on it. Um, Another supporting supplemental documentation that really explains options, there it is, from the T account structure that are important documents, trading strategies and options in cases, along with the option study guide worksheet, uh, and along with, of course, the option trading agenda. It would be remiss of me <laughs> not to include an options chapter exam for you, 75 questions followed by the answers and explanations to take two, two and a half hours through with answers and explanations to be able to identify, um, of course, the account information of the spread or the straddle or the individual contract and, and go through those answers and explanations open book. Your lesson for tonight and for tomorrow and Sunday is as follows. Please write this down. Tonight, reread 16, 14, and 15. Complete. Step two, the notes, which were and are more important today than they have ever been before from the first segment of Fundamentals of Option Contracts all the way through to, of course, second segment, which are the strategies on equity option contracts and touch a little bit on foreign currency and index, but mostly on equities and on NASDAQ. Um, and that's uh, the step area on two on the notes uh, to be followed by, of course, a full reading of my document that I've prepared for you in the options training class agenda through and through.
take your time on it. It's a lot of reading. Tomorrow, I want the notes to be read first. Step two, again, I want you to work with this document, reading it full and through and through on the options training agenda, along with the worksheet that's built into it, the training strategies and the options in cases. And then tomorrow night, not tonight, tomorrow night, I want you to pull out the options chapters and do your level best. Read the question, the account information, the choices. Go right to the actual answer and explanation, which will explain to you why it's A, and B, C, and D are incorrect. And also working through the understanding of the answers and explanations to be able to understand and identify and recognize the spread or straddle. On NASDAQ, there are 38 questions on spreads and straddles. All 38 the same. Question number 28, 29, and 30 will ask you to use the account information similar to margin. Question number 28 will be the client's, what is the client's maximum gain on this uh, transaction? Question number 29 will be, what is the maximum loss? Can anybody tell me what you think question number 30 would be? Break even. Yeah, what is the break even yeah. point? All questions are the same. They are in succession regarding uh, three questions for each one of those 38. Max gain, max loss, to break even on a spread or straddle. Now, I got to tell you something. I'm teaching this for many, many years. And I have to tell you that there's somebody here with me that's your surprise. And he is my colleague. And his name is Rich DeRayo, and he's not good. He's lights out, and we're working together, going close to maybe a decade. And I want you to give him a warm round of applause as he's coming out. I have to say a couple of things about Rich real quick. When it comes to his overall knowledge of the seven, it's impeccable, in my opinion, and the many, many people that I've worked with over the years of almost two decades. Of teaching this training program, I have never seen anybody break these options down like him. He is the very, very best. So um, I'm excited about turning this podium over to him, and I'll tell you why, because on behalf of this podium, as your education, and I couldn't be happier. He is a little bit different than I am in not only his approach, but also uh, in his uh, status uh, in this industry. Rich travels the world. I don't travel the world. I'm a 17 block guy, and I'm not leaving. But he'll go to London, he'll go to Europe. Uh, and people come all over uh, to be able to train with him. And he has come here today for us, uh, rather than uh, us going to him for me to be able to train you on these spread the straddles, and I couldn't be happier for you. He's also a pretty wild guy. You know, don't judge a book by its cover. Dressed down on the stage. He's a rocker. He's in a rock band. He plays bass. He's on Long Island. He plays these wild rock clubs. He plays songs like and groups like, groups like what, Richie? What? Tell me some groups. Incubus. Yes, really. what, what else? He's got a name. I don't even know Incubus. Incubus. Stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. So he's pretty, pretty much uh, he's looks like a conservative uh, guy off the goddamn wall. And he's perfect for us. And I want you to stay real focused today because um, this couldn't be more powerful uh, than anything that you've seen so far. So these areas are critical. Also on Sunday, one day I haven't given you as of yet before Richie starts doing his magic. I want to read it. Please write this down of 1917. I'm bringing 19 and 17 with you before we go into the exciting world of retirement plans, the IRAs, the Keo plans, and the fixed and variable annuities, and the 403B, 401k plans, employee stock ownership, and then start talking about a modified portfolio theories and asset allocation trading strategies and start taking you with the building portfolios and we're going to manage assets and manage products. And so these days coming uh, are, you know where they are, pretty large. One more time. My colleague, my friend, Rich the Rail. Thank you. Good luck. Stay right, focused, guys. First off, have you guys done much on options? Oh, we've done all the fundamentals, Rich. Oh, it's all set. They're ready for you. No, you leave it? No, I'll be around. Right. All right. Let's talk about things you need to know. Before we get into real options, one of the things I ask about is the premium. The options premium, I know Tony goes over this somewhat. Options premium equals the intrinsic value plus the time value. Now, intrinsic value, you're able to figure out. We're going to spend a lot of time on intrinsic value. Time value is just the remainder. So you have to know concepts such as what is the intrinsic value of an option? If you know the intrinsic value, you automatically know the time value. The test time value, the only calculation is if the premium was 7 and the intrinsic value was 5, how much is time value? 
the remaining two. But you have to know the intrinsic value of five. Plus, in a few minutes, we'll be able to gain loss questions. If you know you bought a call at three and the value is now seven, what happened? You're up four points. So if you know the value of an option, it makes profit loss very simple. It makes knowing the time value and the premium pretty straightforward. Now, other than that, time value is pretty much ignored in the test. In real life, time value is the whole thing in options. Hey, I think GE is going to go up. Should I buy the July, the August, or the September option? Should I buy the one that's in the money or out of the money? And those are hard questions. They just say, you buy a call on GE. Like, oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> so time value is a big factor, but for the test, you have to know from the premium to find it. And obviously, if you have the July, August, and the September option on GE, which has the highest premium? August versus July, I'm sorry, September versus July or August, further out in time. So they occasionally give you a real easy question. They give you four different months. The more time, the larger the premium. Now, intrinsic value itself, though, that you really have to get a handle on. Intrinsic value is also known as the option being in the money. In the money is a generic term. It's worth something. If it's in the money, it has value. They call it intrinsic value because the value is on paper. You would actually have to do the stock trade to get the money. But everybody could see on paper that's how much your option would be worth. So if you're in the money seven points, your intrinsic value is seven points, they're synonymous. Out of the money means zero value. The option's worthless. About two-thirds of options end up out of the money, barring worthless every month. Now a tricky thing. In the money does not mean profit. In the money means it has value. Out of the money means it's worthless. It is not necessarily a gain. I bought a stock at 35. Its current value is 25. What's the current value of the stock? 25. Is that a profit or a loss? That's a different question. The profit or loss, I lost 10 if I paid 35 is worth 25. But what is the current value is not the same as profit or loss. So in the money is just the current value. You have to compare that to what you paid in the beginning to see if you're winning or losing. But first, you need to know how far in the money the value of the option. Now, I assume you know a call is an option to buy. So I have an XYZ 50 call. I can buy 100 shares at 50. Do I want to do that? Depends on what XYZ is selling for. Let's say XYZ is selling at a market price of 60. I could buy the stock right now at 50 and immediately sell it at 60. And how much would I put in my pocket? $10 a share. So how far in the money? What's the value of this option? The option's got a value of $1,000. It's 10 points in the money, 50 up to 60. What if the market only went up to 52? That's not much, but is it in the money? Yes, because yes, you can still buy something at 50 worth 52. Now you might have paid more than two for the option, you might not have a profit, but it's worth more than zero, it's currently worth two points. But what if the market price went down to 49 or 30? Would anyone purposely buy a stock at 50 that's only worth 49? No. So what would you do? You wouldn't buy it, the option would expire. What would that option be? Out of the money, worthless. What about at 30? You definitely wouldn't buy a stock at 50 trading at 30, still out of the money. So if you're out of the money, it's just zero. Doesn't matter if you're out of the money by a penny or by 10 points, it's worthless. So which way must the stock price go for a call to be in the money? Up above the strike price. So call up is a basic rule for intrinsic value. How far up is the value of the option? Up from the strike price, if you go from 30 back to 49, still won't help the 50 call, up above 50. Call's an option to buy, you wanna buy low. What makes 50 a low purchase price if the market is up above 50? So calls are up from the strike price. If you had an XYZ 50 put, however, it's an option to sell. So what are you betting the price will do? Go down, and what would make 50 selling high if the market's down below 50? If the market price dropped to 46, you can buy the stock at 46 and sell it for 50 and make $4 a share. 
So our value is $400 on the contract. If the market dropped further to 41, you buy your stock in the market at 41, sell it at 50, make $9 a share, option worth $900. But if the price was 51 or 72, it wouldn't matter. The value is zero. If it's not down, nobody's going to sell it for less than it's trading at. The put would be worthless. So, in the end, an option is a bet on the stock's price direction. Calls bet the price will go up above the strike price, puts down. And the test makes your life easy. They don't ask, did you buy a one month or a three month call? Did you buy the 50 or the 45 or the 55 strike price? If you think it's going to go up, you buy a call. If you think it's going to go down, you buy a put. You're betting on the price direction. So that's in the money, that's value. So let's say they give us a 50 call at a premium of seven, and they tell us the market price is 54. The seven dollars is a given, that's the premium. What is this person really paying for? Well, it's in the money, four points. So four of the seven they're paying is for the current value. Everybody knows it's worth four right now. Plus they have time going forward a month or two on the option, so what else are they paying? The remaining three points is time value. So some questions ask you what's the intrinsic value, some say what's the time value. It's really the same question. To know intrinsic value is call up, to know time value, you have to subtract that intrinsic, the remainder is time. So know what the premium consists of. An option's in the money by four points, even on expiration day, what's the premium going to be? Four points. And if it's got a month before expiration, it could be a lot more than four points. It's four today, plus the potential. That's where all the speculation comes in. What's it worth paying for the future potential? The test just asks you in hindsight how much the time value was. They don't say was seven a bargain or not, just what the seven consists of. So no intrinsic value, call up, put down, no time value. Also, in words, what affects time value besides, obviously, the expiration month? Volatility. Would you pay the same for three months on what Apple stock might do versus what GE stock might do? Well, if you look in the last three months, Apple's moved 30%. GE's moved not nearly that much. They had a nice move earlier, GE, and then once they got back up to about $10, $12, they've been about $10, $12 now for the last five weeks or so. Which is good. They were six for a little while. That was short-lived. But Apple's gone up to the one-something, up to the 150 range, down to the 75 range, back up to 140 now or something. So volatility, you got to pay for. So if volatility goes up, what does that mean? Prices are moving more violently. In what direction? Every direction. So if volatility goes up, all premiums go up, calls and puts, because of more time value, more potential for the future. So volatility goes up, what happens to the call premiums? They go up, put premiums, they go up, because volatility is either direction. And if volatility is down, the market's calm and boring, what do you have? Low premiums, not much expected to happen. Now, related Series 7 question, they ask sometimes, VIX, V-I-X, VIX is the volatility index. It's based on option premiums, what people are basically paying for volatility. So, volatility affects premiums, more volatility, higher premiums, less lower premiums. What measures volatility? VIX, the volatility index. You have to know for the test that they ask you, the VIX is based on the S&P 500, which is the main index of the market. And besides the volatility index, they call it the fear index. Because what do people use options for besides speculation and betting on the future price? To hedge, to protect themselves. And they often use S&P options to hedge. So when people are paying up for the S&P options to buy protection, the VIX is going up. So lastly, the VIX moves opposite the S&P. So if the S&P is going down, the VIX goes up, the fear index, more people are panicking and buying protection in a down market. So 
volatility affects premiums, VIX is a volatility index, and people basically buy up the VIX, buy up volatility to protect themselves in a crazy market. So that's a little background on some things I asked. Definitely know this equation is a simple one, know the value. Now, another angle. Is in the money a good thing? It depends. Does everyone at the craps table want the person with the dice to roll a seven? No. Some people are betting with the shooter. Some people are getting against the shooter. Just like this, everybody on Wall Street wants stock prices to go up. No, some people are short sellers. They're bearish. They make money when the price goes down. So in the money is the options value. But does everybody in the trade want the option to be valuable? No. Who are the two people in options? The buyer and the seller, the long and the short. What do buyers or longs always want their assets to be? Very valuable. But what do shorts always want the asset to be? Worthless. If it goes down to zero, they win a lot of money. So, very important. The buyer of the option wants in the money. They want the option to be very valuable, preferably <coughs> more than they paid. But the seller or writer of the option wants out of the money. They want the option to be completely worthless. It's one of the funnest trades known to man to sell a contract for $500 worth nothing. And four weeks later, the fire is still worth nothing. And you got $500 for nothing. It's an infinite rate of return. 500 back on nothing. But what might happen? The 50 to 1 shot might come in. The long shot won the Kentucky Derby once in a while. And instead of keeping the 500, you're going to pay out 5,000. It happens. But often they expire, you keep the money. So in the money is the option is valuable. Not every investor in the game wants the option to be a winner. They want the option to be a loser. So buyers want in the money. Sellers want options out of the money. Sellers want options to expire worthless. Just like any short seller wants the value to go down basically to what's worthless. So again, don't screw up the concept and think in the money is good or in the money is profit. In the money means it's worth more than zero. Is this good or bad? Depends on what trade I made and also at what price I made that trade. I bought a call for eight, it's in the money by five. Am I winning? No, but at least at five is better than zero. If I paid eight, I'm still losing. So don't say in the money means profit. In the money is the current value. You gotta say where did I start, long or short, and where's the price now? Why do people constantly look in their phones for quotes and go on their computer and get quotes. Why is it my dad turns on his PC, he gets his quotes every morning as if he's going to do anything with it. My dad doesn't sell stock, he gets home. Okay, he's only like stocks in like 75, 76, like ridiculous amounts of time. I'm like, you know, you could have sold those several times a lot of money. He's like, yeah, but I don't need the money. I'll sell them. So someday I'm going to inherit stock and sell but basically, most people are more active than that. And the moment they see the current price, what do they know? The current profit or loss on their investment. Because they know where they started, they need to know what the value now. So that all intrinsic value is in the money, the value now, you gotta compare that to the starting point. So don't overthink it. In the money, seven points is not gain of $700. You got seven, what'd you pay, where'd you start? And we'll do all that in a minute. But first, a useful little summary. We know buyers want options in the money. We know the seller wants options to be out of the money. Which way would the stock price have to go for this to work out for each investor? Well, buying call is the easiest for most people. The buyer wants the call to go in the money. In which way is the money for a call? Up. So buyer but call is bullish on the stock. They expect the price to go up. What would the buyer will put therefore be? Or they be a bear. They believe the price will go down. They need the put to be in the money. What would make a put be in the money? The stock dropping below the strike price. If you know what the buyer wants, what does the seller have to be hoping for? 
opposite. Exactly the opposite. So the seller of a call must be bearish. The seller of a put must be bullish. Now this diagram is a nice summary. Bull and bear is one of the most common test questions on options. They can ask it, if you sold the put, are you bought a bear? Or if you're bearish, what option would you buy or sell? You need to know that result in your sleep. So that has to be a common sense thing. Am I bull or bear? Which one am I betting? It's like when somebody comes to the craft table, they the dice and they go, what do I want to do with these? You're like, yeah, just put your money there. We'll take it in a minute. How come it's sell, bear, bull? No, no, no. If you're the seller of a call, you're a bearish investor. Mm -hmm. If you're the seller of a put, you're a bullish investor. So these are the headings and these are the results. So, if you buy a call, you're bullish. If you sell a call, you're there. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, this table is wonderful in that it is self-fulfilling. Notice the pattern if you go in a circle. Bull, bear, bull, bear. Or counterclockwise, bull, bear, bull, bear. So once you know to set it up, as long as you know the first box is bullish, you get the other three for free. Versus memorizing all four, you have to know what the table looks like. And then you know the first box is bull, you fill it in going in a circle. I recommend you write it out when you use it a couple times in your study, and then in the real test, first thing in your scrap paper, you write it out, and any other little useful memory tricks and summary devices you come up with, and have them there, because there are certain things you know they're gonna ask about. So having a summary, like having the different margin percentages written down, long and short margin and maintenance, because you know they're gonna ask that, but they're not gonna ask a ton of it, so all of a sudden, question 220, they go short, what's the minimum? Go. Oh, I know this. Oh, I know this. It's either 50 or 25 or 30. Shit, that's A, B, and C. So I know it's one of those, but they all look familiar. They know what you memorize, and they give you the right answer and all the other related answers. So writing down things that you could easily remember, but you know are going to be asked. So in the morning, write down the half dozen or 10 or 12 things that are useful. Not really formulas so much, because individual formulas show up once or twice in the test. Concepts, summaries, like the bull and bear table. Remembering that interest rates and bond prices move in the opposite direction. Do you have a suggestion of a sheet that we should write out as soon as we sit down? You do not really. I no. mean, if you want to come to my five-day lecture throughout the five days, I give you boxes every day, on different summaries and so on. But they're all pretty much in the material, most of the summaries and the tables. Like there's, you guys learned about the bond, the spread, not even bond, for underwriters, you got the manager's fee and the concession and the, it's just a simple diagram but by writing it out it makes it easier it's in all the material even the explanations they even show the diagram half the time but something like that by putting in the words then when they give you the numbers in any question you get a working template versus that but if you go through the material you should see a decent amount of little summary things and so on but also don't overdo it people write out every little memory trick and every little device they can think of and then they try to write 30 things down so options, in the beginning, it might help to write down what are the rules for a spread, what are the rules for a straddle. But by writing them, you learn them, then you don't need them the day of the test. It's like writing the rules for two and two is four. Once you do it a few times, you don't need to write it down anymore. But things like that, where you can't really figure it out, picking up your pencil, and the numbers aren't going to give you that answer, you have to kind of memorize it. It's easier to have those things summarized. So you'll see in your studying, there's a lot of things with this, two or three versions of the story. And you know it's the same starting story, but there are three different outcomes. How do you remember? You make yourself some little thing that reminds you what to look at for which version. But you have to do you know, a thousand questions and know the basics to start figuring out what you could summarize and what you could shorten up. <clears throat> the seven is harder than you think. If you know it like a foreign language, you translate everything one word at a time back to English, you are doomed. You'll be able to read the question in series seven language and think in those terms. If you translate everything back, then you're like, it could be B or it could be D, because your translations are fuzzy and not precise enough. So in the beginning, you try to translate everything back to plain English. But you have to do enough studying that you could think in that terms and apply it the way it's supposed to be, not always simplifying it down again. But you will find certain things, no matter how well you understand it, there are still three outcomes to keep track of. It's not bad giving you some memory devices or some ways to keep it organized. But a lot of it is using your study time intelligently. There's a lot to memorize, but if you just memorize it and have no idea what it means, you end up failing the test. Everything looks familiar, but you go, yeah, it could be B, it could be D, it could even be C. 
You have to know it really specifically, not kind of vaguely. Plus, if you're kind of vague and they put any trick or twist in the question, you miss it completely because you're so busy trying to remember the definition that you don't see half the words in the question and they go right over your head and they catch you with all kinds of nonsense. And you'll see when you do a lot of practice questions, the wording of the question is more difficult than the concept they're catching you on most of the time. So the concept has to be under your belt so you could think about what the question is really saying. Now back to the main option things. The bull and bear table comes up as the word question, bull or bear. The main number question is gain, loss, and break even. Break even <laughs> is real simple. So we'll start with that. If you bought a call for four, how much do you need to get back to break even? Four. four. If you bought a put, what would you need? Same amount, the premium. So when you start out, how is the buyer? They're losing money. They paid the premium. What do they need to do? Go in the money by the premium just to get even. And the seller starts out with the buyer's money. What do they have to do? Give back that much money to break even. If it's in the money that much, they would pay that out to the buyer. So an option will break even when it's in the money by the premium. Again, as a definition, it's not so important the words, it's what that implies. But you have to be in the money by exactly the premium. Now what we learn in the money is, call up. So you take the strike and you add the premium. Because if you have a 50, call it 4, when would you break even? If it's 54, in the money, 4 points. What would a put have to do to break even? Go down. By how much? The premium. So it's almost the same equation, but it's strike price minus the premium. You have to remember which is which. So if you had a 50 put at 4, you'd say put go down, 50 down by 4, 46 is the break even. But if it was a 50 call at 4, you'd say call go up. So it's 50 plus 4. 54 break even. You know they're going to offer you 54 and 46 for both of those questions. Because they assume you realize break even is the strike price and the premium. But how do you remember that you add the premium, subtract the premium? Because calls are always up. What's up is why? Add it. Puts it down, down implies subtracting. So don't think of break even as a formula, think of it as a rule. Call go up to break even, puts go down to break even. And you know after a little practice what numbers is always a strike in the premium. It's just a matter of you add or subtract. Now break even is easy because if you bought the option and you break even, what the seller do? They broke even also. So if I bought that put or sold that put at 46, I'd be even. The buyer would get their four back from the seller, everybody's even. For gain loss or bull or bear, you need to know if I buy or sell the call, it changes your point of view. But break even, ending at zero, same for everybody. So break even is one of the only things an option where knowing you're the buyer or the seller doesn't change the rule. You know all calls go up to break even, all puts down to break even, but simple addition or subtraction. But you have to remember is addition or subtraction, which one? So bull or bear, break even, finally on to our gain loss story. Before we get into a real option example for gain loss, I really like one big board better. The too far apart for a little weird. You used to be able to kind of, you know, point the one thing right the other, but you guys can see it, so we'll work it out. Let's say I have ten dollars. I buy stuff for four dollars. What's my total now? A fourteen or B six? Well, either you add the 4 or you subtract the 4 from the 10. 
How do you know when you subtract? Because you bought stuff, and whenever you buy stuff, what does that mean in word problems? Minus, you paid money. What'd you buy? Coffee, a bond, an option, a spread, a long straddle. It doesn't matter what you bought. Anything you bought, you paid for it. So buy implies a negative sign, subtracting the number. Now that said, you sold some stuff for $4. What would your total be? 14. Because what's selling stuff? You receive money. Selling is plus. That's not options, that's word problem. Word problems is translating the words into an equation. Billy got $10 from Grandma for his birthday. Billy went to the store and bought candy for $4. What does Billy have now? You simply subtract the four. Sally sells seashells in the seashore for 10 bucks. What does Sally have? You add the 10 bucks to the total. So, so buy minus sell plus. That's not options, that's just always word problems. Now, in options, they'll say you bought a call for four. So how are you starting out this game? Minus four. When you total it out, the four's gotta have a minus sign on it, that's money you paid. And if you sold the call for four, what's that four gonna be? Mm -hmm. Plus four, you're gonna add that in, plus positive to your total. Most of gain loss questions are accounting. Accounting for the premium you started with and the value of the option now. They tell you the premium you started with in every question, and they tell you if the premium is positive or negative by saying you bought or sold the option, you're long or short of the option. So the first thing you do is account for the premium. Did I pay or receive the premium? And then all you do is compare that to the value now. So let's look at a basic example. I am long in ABC October 60 call at four. Before I even look at what happened after, I account for the trade I made already. Good point hope about the T charts, money in, money out. That's accounting. The D charts and accounting table keep the track of which way the money's going. Since I am long at four, that is a minus four. So where will I put out 400 or in 400? Oh, uh, the out. So the premium, I paid out 400. Before the example, it was in and then out. Is it true? Stick it to, stick to this way? Oh, is that what he does? So okay. Yeah, we're talking about the side. How they show that he's paid in this will be consistent. The book is all in and out. It's in first and then out? Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, I'm just looking at Tony's notes before he wrote in first and then out. Yeah, we show us the notes things too. You always got to go in quick. You always got to go in quick. Tony uses different material than I use in my own life. So, take it out of me. So, the premium is money out, that's $400. Long as you have the right labels, that's the key, so make sure if you're looking for different material, you check the headings. Because I know that is different material, they have to charge in different ways. It's out in. And you're in. So that point depends on what material you're looking. So, but the long as you check the labels. It has it as out in. And that's the way you usually teach it, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, we do it that way in the notes too, this way it's all the same. So out of the chapter 15, 16, that's the material I usually work with and that, that has out. Yes, so yeah, it's not all right. So back when we don't for Not important as long as you look at the words and not just the position. But it's something you do want to be consistent with so that you don't have to always double think which is which. You want it to kind of look familiar and feel familiar. Now you paid 400. Now they tell you the market price of ABC has now gone up to 67. What is this call worth? Well, call, you know, up from the strike price. How far up is that? Seven. seven. So it's worth seven. What do you think if you're the buyer and paid the premium? Do you now get what the option's worth or do you have to pay what the option's worth? You're going to get what the option's worth. You're the buyer. You own it. 
So you get the intrinsic value. You have the right to buy a stock at 60, the worth 67. So the intrinsic value would be money in $700. Now to get that seven, you would buy the stock at 60 and sell for 67, but you don't want to write down buying and selling the stock because that causes places where you can screw up. You know when the stock trade is all finished, how much money will be left over, the intrinsic value. That's why I thought with intrinsic value, rather than do the trade. We showed you to get intrinsic value, you're actually buying and selling the stock, but you know every dollar up on the call is how much you'd be worth after you trade the stock. So you just count it up seven, you put in the seven. This way you only get two numbers. And it is a fact that never varies. The intrinsic value always opposite the premium. Meaning on the opposite side of the T chart. If you're a buyer and you pay the premium and you own the asset, you get the value. Whereas if you're a seller and you receive the premium, what do you have to do? You have to pay the buyer out. In gambling terms, the buyer is the gambler. They put down four and said, I bet it goes up. And they win every dollar it goes up. The seller is the bookie. They took the four and said, I bet it doesn't go up. But if it goes up, they must pay every dollar. The material talks about how the buyer has the right and the seller has the obligation. The buyer is right because they paid the premium. They get the value of the option they own. The seller's obligation, they must give the buyer the value. They would really give the buyer a stock for 60, worth 67, and take a $7 loss in the stock, and the buyer would make a $7 gain in the stock. But we don't need to do the stock trade. We know when it's all done, the buyer gets the value, the seller pays the value. So once you know what sign goes to the premium, what side it goes on, what's the intrinsic value? The opposite side. The buyer pays the premium minus so they get the value back. That's what they want in the money. The seller receives the premium. You can't receive money and then you say, I'm done, I'm going home. You have a future liability, you must pay out the value, whatever it is. With what the seller is hoping it is, is zero out of the money. But if it's in the money, the seller must pay the buyer that amount. So, as a buyer, you paid the four, you got seven, you got a $300 gain. Now, what if we did the same example but it was sell the 60, call it four. Market price is still 67. What is the only difference gonna be? The numbers are gonna flip sides. But first thing you do is you account for the investment you made. You're a seller, you receive four. So the premium is on the money inside. Once you know where the premium is, where does the intrinsic have to be? On the other side. Again, rather than putting the 60 and 67 to the table, what do we do? We count how far up from 60 do we go. We went up seven. So what the value when all the stock trading is done? $700. The seller would have to get out the 700 of 300 loss. The numbers are identical. The question is the accounting. Did you pay four and get back seven? Or did you receive four and then pay out seven? Big difference. Whenever one person gains 300, someone else out there lost 300, you have to know which person you are. Now you can get that answer of three five different ways, but if you don't know if it's plus or minus three, it's useless. For example, the stupidest method. 67 minus 60 minus four, three. But that doesn't help me one damn bit because A says gain 300, B says lost 300. So coming up with the three, you can do it any way you want, but it doesn't help you if you don't think about the right concept. And the concept is which is the money in, which is the money out, the counting. Which is my buy price, which is my sell price. So the first thing you're doing is, is see you're a seller of it, so you're going to receive it, which means it's on the inside, yep. plus uh, plus the right? And then the second thing you're doing is you see it's a call, so call up, 
and it's seven different, so you put the seven in the out and the other side. Exactly, on the other side. Right? Seven because it's on the other side, right? Exactly. So basically, buy, sell here, this is step one, the accounting. And then the call up, put down, is step two, what's the value? So I know I bought IBM at 105. How am I doing? Next question, what's the current price? I sold short IBM at 105. How am I doing? The next question is the same. What's the current price? But if I'm long, I want it to be more than I paid, short less than I paid. So that's the tricky part, because they're going to give you gain 300, loss 300. You're like, yeah, I got a three. But you have to do it. That's why I don't like putting the stock trade in there. If you put the 60 and the 67, you got three numbers. Where do they go? It depends. If you only have two numbers, it's always one on each side. You can't mess up the accounting and get it backwards. If you do it the long way and fill in the stock trade, when you sell a put, you're selling a sell, makes you a buyer of the stock, and how the hell selling sell becomes a buy is just confusing and irrelevant. If the put's down nine, how much money when you're all done? Nine. If you're a buyer, you get the money, seller, you pay the money, opposite the premium. So cut to the chase. They don't ask you, how do you know it's in the money seven? Why is up the right direction? They ask you, gain three or loss three, multiple choice. So if you were at Harvard Business School, they make you write an essay of how you know it's seven and why you made that investment. Here they just ask you, what's the outcome? The race is over, what's your bet pay? So first question, what am I? The buyer, the gambler, the seller, the bookie, pay or receive the premium. If you pay the premium, you know you will receive the intrinsic value at the end. If you're the seller and receive the premium, you owe, you must pay out the value at the end. So once you know you're a buyer or a seller, next question, what's the value at the end? They gave you the market price, what's the value of my option? That's your basic gain-loss calculation question. Some are harder, some are easier, but that's pretty much the thought process. Where did I start and what's the value now? That's why people want quotes, they want to know the current value. Now, I'm going to take the sell out so I can do a few other things with the buy example. But the first point is, buy and sell is just the variable. The numbers are identical. Buy and sell tells you which sides the number goes on. That's very important. Now, besides this, they can of course ask us break even. Break even, we would say calls go up. So we would add 60 plus 4, 64. And in this case, if I'm a buyer or a seller, it wouldn't change it. Break even, you ignore the signs. There's no plus or minus premium. It's just call, you add the premium, put, you subtract the premium. And notice, where is 67? Three points above break even. And what is the buyer of a call? The buyer of a call is bullish. I wanted to go up. It went up three points past even. I made three points, which is logical. Now, they don't combine all those questions together, but what can you say when you bought a call? What were you hoping would happen? It would go up. Where do you break even? Up by the premium. How much did you gain or lose? Depends on how far up the price went. So that's your basic question. Now they also bring up this max gain, max loss concept. Max gain, max loss, I call the cookie cutter questions. The answers are identical. The choices never vary. You just have to know which choices to pick. But they always give you the same choices. I can tell you what the questions and answers will be on the test right now. You have to remember, though, which answer to choose of the choices. They always give you the same four choices. You have to know which is which. Now, if you paid $400, what's the lowest the intrinsic value could be? Zero. And how would that leave you? Losing 400. Could the buyer of an option at four ever lose more than four? No. Does it matter if the call or a put? No. What's the most the buyer of any investment could ever lose the price they paid? So the max loss is always going to be the premium. In this case, $400, but always the premium. Now you'll see that come up several times, because if it's call or put, it doesn't matter. It's always the premium. Spread or straddle doesn't matter either. If you pay the premium, you can't lose more than you pay. 
So buyers have limited risk to premium, most they can lose. But if it goes in the money, they win. It's gotta go up four to break even, but above that, they profit. And how far up could a stock price go in theory? Unlimited. Unlimited. I've seen a lot of crazy things on Wall Street in my years, but I haven't seen unlimited. But in the Series 7, stocks are unlimited 10 or 12 times during the day. They trade it unlimited. So up is unlimited. That's why I call it cookie cutter coin. When they give you 67, the answer could be any number. When they say max gain for a call is unlimited, there's no calculation of pencil and paper ain't gonna help you. Now what I mean by cookie cutter, they're gonna offer you one, two, three, four. One, gain 400, two, loss 400. Three, gain unlimited, four, loss unlimited. Is it one and three, one and two, one and four, two and four? One answer you know is 400 the premium and one is unlimited. That's the only two choices they give you, but they put the word gain next to both and loss next to both. So how do you start it? You say I'm long, my premium is minus four. What do I think minus four is? Max gain or max loss for my investor? Max loss. A negative number is definitely a loss. So what's unlimited have to be by default? The max gain. Even if you don't remember it's unlimited going in, you remember when you read the four choices because they offer you unlimited or the premium number. That's the only thing they offer. They offer you 97 or 104 because they know that's impossible. So premium unlimited, that's it. They assume you've learned at least that much. But it says gain unlimited or loss unlimited. Depends on a buyer or a seller. So max gain loss. You almost recognize. Don't try to memorize it. You'll get enough examples. You'll remember which is which. But even when it's not unlimited, spreads don't have unlimited, puts don't have unlimited. But what is the max law still the premium? And if you know that and you look at the other three choices, it's usually not hard to figure out what's left over for the other maximum, be it a spread or a straddle or whatever. Because they kind of repeat it. They give you 37 and 4, gain and loss, and they give you 4 and 37 for gain and loss. You know, I guess another one, well, it must be 37. So a lot of questions, the answers, the numbers themselves, the result is given. Your real job is the accounting. Is that the gain answer or the loss answer? There's only four choices. They only offer two different possibilities, but it's gain for gold, loss for gold. That's why, to me, the real question of the market 67, they give you four different numbers, anything could happen. When they give you max gain loss, they give you the same answers every time. It's just a matter of knowing which is the plus, which is the minus. And the premium for the buyer is always the minus the loss, whatever's left over. In this case, on the minute the gain. So make sure you know the real questions with real numbers and then recognize your max gain loss. People want to like, get max gain loss tattooed in their forearm because they think it's so important. It's one of the least important things in option because the answers make it a gimme. If you didn't just fill in the blank, it'd be harder. But it's not fill in the blank, the answer they're there. With a little practice, that becomes repetitive. The one where there's not one set answer, they give you four different numbers at a different market price, that you have to think about. And they don't give you anything at all, but just ask you conceptions, which is riskier, or safer, which would you recommend in a bear market, that requires a little more thought. If you know the max gain loss of all four, you can tell which is riskier and safer. But you start recognizing what the test thinks is the safest and riskiest because you see enough examples of that. Don't just focus on the numbers though. Make sure you know what trade is appropriate, what market environment, and which are safer and riskier than each other. Because people focus all on the numbers, they do the numbers in their sleep. That's 20 of the 50 option questions on the numbers. Another 20 are what trade is the best, or what trade is the safest, or what trade is the riskiest. You have to know those which you can tell from the numbers very often, but the numbers alone don't work as everything for options. Now, let's do quickly a cell phone, and then I'll do the put examples. We'll make it different numbers in X, Y, Z, 90, call it 6. First off, bull or bear? That's a common question. You look it up on your table. Sell call is bear. Why is it bearish? Because you want the option out of the money and up makes the call valuable. So this person's a bearish investor. 
What would be their break even? How do you do break even for a call? Same as you did for the last call. Calls go up. 90 plus 6. 96. Does it matter you're bearish? No. Calls still go up. What do you want to do though? Not go up to 96. Because what are you starting out as as a seller here? You're a plus 6. What do you want to happen? The option to expire and you keep the 6. But if it goes up 6, you're even. You didn't lose, you didn't win, you're even. But what are you? Bearish. Where do you want to stay? Below 96. Preferably below 90 and keep all the money. But at 96, you're still even. The buyer gets back to 6 from what he gave you. Now, an interesting angle on this. Rather than ask bull or bear and break even, they say, what would be a profit? And they give you choices like this. They give you 85, 95, 100, 105. Now, what do you need to know? You're bearish, you want it to be down. But down below which number? Down below 90 to strike price or down below 96 to make a profit? Below 96. Anything below 96, you win. Below 90, you win all of it, but anything below 96. So it's 85 and 95. 95 is up in the money, but in the money, how many? Five. So what would you have to pay the buyer back? Five, and what the buyer pay you? Six, it's still a profit. They like that question because most people just look up or down from the strike price. And they would pick 85 only for a profit, but it's up or down from even, which is the break even number, not the strike. That's why the seller has the edge. If it's out of the money, they win. If it's in the money by less than the premium, they still win. The buy needs to go the right direction by more points of the premium before time runs out. If it moves by less points the wrong direction, or moves next week when it's expired already, the seller already keeps the premium. So, what would a buyer want? They're bullish, they want any price above break even. And if you're bearish, what do you want? Any price below break even. But up or down from even, not up or down from the strike price. But that's, instead of every question saying, calculate the break even, is the investor bull or bear, pick the right answer, they find other ways to word the question that are still really asking you, do you know break even, do you know bull or bear, do you know the basics without repeating the question word for word and always ask the basics. That's why you have to do the quiz and the practice questions because you can know the facts and be not sure which facts to think about. Is bull and bear important here? Is buy or sell important here? Is call or put important here? Which matters in this question? And by doing the practice questions, you'll realize the few little rules are all you need, but you have to know which rule matters. You learn addition, subtraction, location, division. Which one do you use? All of them you can do. You have to know which one to use from what the question says. All right, now since it's a seller, we'll write out max gain, max loss. Now this one you should see coming. One of these answers is gonna be 600, the premium. Which one is it? The gain or the loss when you're a seller and you're plus six? Gain. It's a gain. Since the premium is gain. the gain of 600, guess how much they could lose? Unlimited. So that's what I mean, it becomes cookie cutter for a buyer or seller. They're gonna offer you the premium number and unlimited. But they're going to say, is the unlimited the gain or the unlimited the loss? If the premium is the gain or the loss, which one is which? Buyer, the premium is minus, it's the loss. Sell the premium plus, it's the gain. And therefore, unlimited is the other one. Once you know the premium, you know where unlimited falls. Now, real question, real calculations. They say the market price went up. to 94. What's the investor's profit or loss at expiration date? The market is 94. The calls exercise is what happens. Again, we start with step one, accounting. Am I the buyer or the seller? I am the seller, so the premium is money in $600. So if the premium is in, where's the next number got to go? Money out. And the next thing you do, step two, is what's the value, what's the current price? 
I know the starting price I sold for six, what's it worth now? Call up, put down. This is call up. How far up from 90 is 94? Up four. If you paid out four and took in six, what happened? You're plus two. Even though it's in the money, you still have a profit because it's in the money by four, you sold it for six. And that happened very frequently. The sellers would get all the premium, but the option goes in the money, is not enough. So when the stock is very volatile, what happens? The premium is even higher. The stock has to move even more. It's a week before earnings, what's the premium going to be? Huge, because they know when earnings come out, it's going to move big. So you got to pay up. So it's like, you know, waiting for your team to have won three games. Say, yeah, they're going to win the seven series. I know. And it's like, yeah, they won three games already. You're not going to get the same odds as you went before and bet. So if you buy an option with nothing on the horizon and get lucky and something big happens, you win. If you buy it right before a big event, you're going to pay the big premium. You're not going to get the same return like anything else. The odds depend on the timing and the risk you take. That's why in real life, the premium and time value volatility is so keen at the odds of the bet. The test just says, you think it's going up, you buy a call. What's the premium? Whatever it is, I'll pay it. No argument. But it's never that simple. But on the test, they say it's expiration day. What happens? Do you're in the money, out of the money, what do you get? Buyer gets the value, seller pays it. So what do you do with the put option? Exactly the same. Gain loss at the price, break even, bull or bear. Those are the questions on single options. So we'll run through a put example, but we'll see if we can fit them side by side. Five. Uh, I'm going to read out the stock in the month to keep it easy. An 80 put. Five. And sell the same 80 put at five. These people are betting against each other. The buyer is the gambler. I bet five. The stock will go down from 80. The seller is the bookie. They take the five and say, I bet you're wrong. Doesn't have to go up. Doesn't have to go down. Just doesn't have to go down below 80 by more than five. So again, the seller doesn't have to really predict exactly what will happen. Just bet the buyer is wrong. Now on the test, the buyers win most of the time because what options do in the test? Go in the money. In real life, two-thirds is buying worthless, but for the test, they owe the money a lot. So don't think options are as much fun as the test makes them look. On the test, the buyers make a lot of money very easily. It doesn't work that way. Now first, bull or bear. Well, we look up buy, put, we get bear, sell, put, we get bull. The buyer wants in the money. Which way is the money for a put? Down, so they're bearish. Seller wants it to be out of the money. If it goes up, the put's worthless. But again, this summarizes buyer wants in the money, seller wants out of the money without having to go through the process every time. Now, what about break even? For the buyer, you say put down 80 minus 5, 75. To the seller, you'd also say, put down. Same answer. What's the real difference? The buyer wants to get lower than 75, they're bearish. The seller wants to stay up above 75, they're bullish. But if it's 75, nobody wins, nobody loses. It moves exactly five as the premium predicted it would. So, break even is the only time buy and sell is irrelevant, puts go down. It is opposite because the buyer wants to be on one side of 75, seller on the other. But for the question itself, same answer. They ask, what's the profit? Depends on either buyer or seller above or below 75. How is the strike price? It sounds. Strike prices are set in $5 increments around the current market price. So, the stock trading at 72, they put a 70 and a 75 ball and put out there. And as the stock moves and drops to 68, they add the 65 bull and put. So over time, the option could live for nine months. There could be options from 35 up to 75 that were written in previous months when the stock was near there. And I think you can go out further if the stock gets higher, I think above 100, you can go out up to $10 on each side. So there's more strikes available for lower price stocks. You only go 
you know, the five dollar increments on each side, but that's the idea. So you could right now have an IBM 30 core input at 105 for IBM. You come up with something around 100, 110, 105, and those are the things you could add. If there's an old one at 80 from when it was down three months ago, it hasn't expired yet, you can buy that too or sell it. But the idea is new options come out around the current price, always zeros and fives. In real life now, for low price stocks, they go to two and a half, they go to one dollar, whatever the market will pick. But that's because now you got things like GE down at twelve dollars and City at three dollars. Also, they have options at fifties and increments on, on City because it's so low, it's a huge company. But historically, that doesn't happen. So basically, if companies are reasonable stock prices, five dollar moves is the normal thing. And I wanted to test every strike price ends in a zero or a five in every question, every strike price, because that's the standard. Now, next, max gain, max loss. One of these is going to be $500 for both. The question is, which is which? For the buyer, what is the premium? It's a minus five, so the loss, max loss, $500 premium. For the seller, what do I know? It's a plus five. What's a plus five have to be? The max gain is the five hundred dollar. Now, the buyer wins if it goes down. <coughs> How far down could you go? Could you go down unlimited? Could only go down to zero. So an eighty point could only drop eighty points. If the buyer wins 80 and paid 5, what's their game? 75. Always equal to the break even. Because once they go below 75, they win. How far down can they go? 75 points to zero. What's the most the seller can lose? The same 7,500. Always equal the break even. It's not at 75. It's from 75 down to zero. The buyer wins, and what's that equal? 75. From 75 down to zero, the seller loses. It equals 75 wherever you're even. Because once you cover the premium, the first five, the rest is profit for buyer, loss for seller. On the call, you go from break even up. How far is up? It's unlimited. For put, you stop at zero. But they're not going to offer you unlimited in this question. They're going to offer you gain 75, loss 75, gain 5, or loss 5. Pick the two appropriate answers. So you know it's going to be the premium and the strike minus the premium. But you have to know it's the premium, the 5, the gain, or the loss. The 7,500 is the other one. So bull or bear, standard question, break even, max gain, max loss. And of course, a real question that requires the most work. If the market price were 71, what would be the gain or loss to this investor? This is the one where you don't know what it is until you pick up your pencil and figure it out. This is the word problem type example. First word you focus on is you're a buyer, so you know the T chart, the premium is money out. You pay 500, negative 5. If the premium is money out, where does the strike price have to be? Sorry, intrinsic value have to be. Money in. You get the value, you get the in the money amount for owning the option. How do puts have value? We know puts go down. So step two, find the value. How far down is 71? Nine points. Five went out, nine came in, four hundred dollar gain. So first thing you do, am I a buyer or a seller? You put the premium on the right side of the T chart. Second thing you do is you find the value from the call and put and put it on the other side of the T chart. Price. Market price 
of 65. On your own, figure out the gain or loss for the seller of that option with a market price of 65. And don't get out the answer, I'll put it up there in a minute. you should ask yourself, who am I, the buyer or the seller? Accounting for the trade you already made. The trade you already made was you sold the put at five. What does that tell you? The premium is plus five money in. So always the first step is accounting for the trade you already made, where is the premium paid or received? Seller received it. Next step is, what is the option worth now? What's the end result? The end result is the intrinsic value. For value, you know, calls go up from the strike, puts go down from the strike. How far down is 65? 15. And what side does the 15 have to go on? Opposite the premium, has to go money out. So the intrinsic value is 1,500. If 15 went out and 5 came in, you're minus 10, a thousand dollar loss. The question says you sold short an asset for 5, it's now up to 15 and you've got to cover it. If you sell for 5, you've got to pay out 15 to cover it, you lost 10. The buyer bought an asset at 5, it now has a value of 9, what happened? If you buy anything at 5, it's now worth 9, you made 4. What you bought is not the key thing really. The question is, I bought something, what did I pay, and what's it worth now? I sold something, what did I receive, versus what's it worth now? Then you have to know what it's worth now, that's the real option part of the question, is it a call or a put? Calls have value up, puts down, you have to know the value. If they tell you the trade, you have to find the current value compared to the starting premium. So max gain loss, they ask, gain loss given the market price, they ask, for a even or a bear. That's the only thing you can do with a single option, except in general, they say. You expect good news, what do you do? Buy a call or buy a put? You buy a call. Bad news, what do you do? You buy the put. Also, for the test, and I assume you can tell from the numbers, who has more risk, the buyer of an option or the seller of an option? The seller. The seller has the odds in their favor, the buyer needs more things to go right. But the buyer could win 10, 20, 30 pounds that they paid. The seller could only win the premium. So the seller's like the book who takes 50 to 1 bets. They know they keep the one a lot. Every now and then, some sucker hits that 50 and that wipes out the other 49 guys. You didn't get to keep their money. So you know, hopefully, 100 guys can eat that bet with you before one hits for 50. So that's why little people can't sell. You have to sell to a lot of different people on different options, like operating a casino. If you just take bets, against people just yourself, against two of your friends, you've got a bad deal there. You take bets against 200 different people, there'll be enough idiots out there to make a living off of them. So that's the idea. The buyer needs it to do the right thing. Seller needs it to expire. The buyer has less risk or lose the premium. The seller has more risk, potentially unlimited. But the buyer needs everything to go right to make money. The seller makes money if anything goes wrong for the buyer, but they make less. So buying low risk relatively, selling high risk. Now that's in options. All options are risky compared to a nice mutual fund or a blue chip stock or definitely compared to government muni bonds. But within the option world, what's high risk, selling what's low risk is buying. But overall, options are speculative, not suitable for custodian account or retired couple to use in a speculative manner. Now our next story brings us to straddles, which is nice and easy because straddles are two options, but you only use one. The other option expires. 